What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. A for Screen and Country Special Presentation The Hadric Files Episode 2 Hangmen Also Die We have returned once again, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are. This is a special presentation this week of our usual podcast called For Screen. And country and all the energy that Jason is just like rolling over us with this week. Holy, I got to write spent after that. Well, that's my uh, that was my intent, Brendan, to uh, ride you hard and put you away wet. I don't like this. I don't no, like this, Jason. You don't you, like that? No. You don't put me away wet. You put me away when I'm good and dry, and I'm done. But you're not my prize horse. You're 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 an old nag, you see. You, Wait. You're good for a ride in the rain, but I'm not going to, you know. <laughs> Come on. Jason, what the hell are you doing with my horses? Look, this is neither here nor there. You pay your saddle fees. You pay your stable fees. Everything's taken care of. That's that's neither here nor there. You leave Seabiscuit out of this. My God. Brendan, have you read the book called Seabiscuit? I have seen the movie called Seabiscuit. Movie's okay. Read the book. The book is one of the most fantastic pieces of nonfiction I've ever read. It's beautifully written. It's it's intense. It's wonderful. Yes, but does the book have Tobey Maguire? Um, some copies have him on the cover. Mm, not good enough. If he's not a character, I'm not interested. Well, That's for every book. I mean, I don't think... That's for every book, Jason. And in fact, that means the only I mean... books that I've read are the story of the Pussy Posse, and uh-huh, Toby sure. McGuire's autobiography and everything else could okay. suck a now, dick. Now those are those are books that it would be reasonable to to find that Toby McGuire was a character in. But I'm pretty sure that though it is based on a true story, Toby McGuire not alive in the 20s. Mm, uh, see, that's not, not not around for the book. But that's not my problem per se. They could have written him in as a character. Um, and certainly, I don't know that uh, historians would be that bothered by it. I mean, look, you got your sea biscuit story, you got your accuracy about the yeah. horse, you got your fucking races, you okay. got your glue factory, whatever. But like, hey, now. Toby Maguire can exist in this world. He's just give him like a cameo, just let in the book, just let him show up and be like, you know what? That's one fast horse. If that's not a fast horse, my name's not Toby Maguire. And then he web slings and swings away, and, and enters a time portal. No, that's crazy. Jason, this isn't a science fiction novel. No, God, how I wish it were. No, we are a podcast, Brendan, that normally talks about current Toby war Maguire. movies. Oh. And Toby Maguire on occasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this week is a bit different because we are continuing our special presentation feature on the life and, more specifically, the death of Nazi boy number one, Mr. Toby Maguire. Reinhard Heydrich. Oh. Nope. Reinhard Heydrich, Tommy oh, McGuire. Okay. There is no evidence that, to my knowledge, that he's a Nazi. <laughs> right. He's never he's never appeared in public espousing Nazi beliefs. Now, so, tell me this: Have you ever seen him in an interview claim not to be a Nazi? I can't say that I have. Okay, has he ever in uh, in answering a question about whether he was a Nazi said "Nazi me"? No. I don't well, know then how do you know? that question. How do you know? You, you're right, Brendan. You're right. I don't know. I don't know. And I shouldn't make assumptions. I pose that to you, the Twitterverse, the Xverse, the X-Men, whatever you call it now. Is Toby Maguire a Nazi? Uh, like for yes, retweet for absolutely. Let me know. So I, so if I'm to understand you, the, the what we've come down on is that <laughs> if you're a Nazi, unless you have explicitly said in front of God and, and everyone that you are not a Nazi, we have to assume that you are, in fact... A Nazi. That's what that's what you're telling me, Brian. 
So you're wanting people to take a, an oath, a loyalty pledge, to say, like, oh, no, look, I'm not a Nazi. But if they don't say – I mean, that's very easy to say. But if they don't say that, then uh, in your mind, everybody's a Nazi. And once everybody's a Nazi, Brendan, <laughs> you, can't, you can't take pleasure in shooting Nazis anymore. Oh, I almost spit out my beer. Well, that was my intent. <sighs> to choke you. Lord. And take the financial empire that is this podcast, <laughs> which I would find to be very tiny. <laughs> oh, yes. I Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. If you don't explicitly yeah. say that, state that you're not a Nazi to the media, okay. then you are basically admitting your own Nazism. All right. That's fair. So I'll, I'll be the first to say, uh, with my hand on uh, my favorite book, Dune, uh, I say... I thought you were going to say of... my favorite book, Mein Kampf. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this this means something. I got to be safe. I, I can't be making jokes. I got to pick a book that actually means something to me. So mm-hmm, I put my hand mm-hmm. on Dune by Frank Herbert, and I say, I am not now, nor have I ever been a Nazi. I have on occasions been fascinated with Nazi uniforms and Nazi equipment and certainly Nazi history. Uh, Nazi leaders have found them interesting, but I personally have never been a Nazi. And that is despite the fact that I have a shaved head. That shaved head is simply because I was going bald anyways, and fuck you for judging me. Okay, and I will put my hand on a book uh, by, you know, a noted author, Tyra Banks. The book, of course, is Model Land. And I will say I am also not Z. I'm also Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. That, that Nazi. is acceptable too. That 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 works. Yeah. So if you'd like to make your loyalty <laughs> pledges, uh, <laughs> please send them in to Brendan's loyalty pledge at yahoo.gov.co.uk. That's right. But we're not here to make everybody take loyalty pledges. At least, well, I mean, we're going to have our telethon certainly to do that, but that's later on. No, yeah. we're here to talk about our special feature this week, which is the life and death, specifically, of uh, Uber Nazi boy number one, Reinhard Heydrich. Last time we did this podcast, we watched the film Conspiracy, starring mm. Kenneth Branagh as the Nazi, Reinhard Heydrich. And we got a good amount of time with Heydrich, but. We've moved on to a movie this week from the era, from a contemporary time, in fact, specifically 1943, not two years after Heydrich's death. Yeah, just one this year. This movie was made. Just one year, even. Mm. Uh, uh, this movie was made about uh, Heydrich's assassination, and it's called Hangman Also Die. Heydrich has actually has a very small role in this movie at the very beginning, but... It's his uh, his uh, assassination, which of course sets the course for this movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you mentioned a year after. I'll even uh, I'll even just one up you a little bit here and say this movie went into production four months after the death of Reinhard Heydrich. This has to be the first movie about his death. It, it is the first movie about his death. Yeah, there there is another movie that comes out this year. I, I think are we going to watch it? Hitler's Madman. Hitler's Madman. Mad we'll called? talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about that. That also came out in 1943, but this was the first oh. one. And this is a movie which is very much in the vein of another movie we watched, Brendan, called Air Force, mm-hmm. where this is about a real-life event. It was made very shortly after the event. It was probably rushed into production, much like Air Force. I, I don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Air Force, it was before the entire story was known about what happened. So this movie is basically a fictionalized account uh, of Heydrich's assassination because it <laughs> does not match the actual story at all. Yeah, well, this is, I think, the idea is like, holy shit, one of the worst Nazis in history has just been yeah. killed. Let's make a rah-rah movie about it because fuck Absolutely. that dude. And that was the thing is that it was it was a while before, you know, because the war happened and not everything, you know, was declassified right away. And, and it eventually came out that, yeah, that was how he died and who did it and, and what happened to them and... Mm-hmm. Which we will definitely see movies about later on when we get into stuff like Operation Anthropoid and things like that. Operation Anthropoid. Yes, that is a movie. Yeah. I thought you were making a jokey yeah. title, and I was no. like, "Oh wait, that's the name of the movie." That's a real movie. Yeah. Um, wait, are you are you are you combining Operation Daybreak and Anthropoid? Well, okay. I, what I am is so there is a movie called Anthropoid. Operation Anthropoid was the name of the operation to kill oh. Hadrian, which was which was. Perpetrated by two Czech 
uh, t- I think they're Czech Army guys. Now, that, was uh, that a situation where the Czech Army guys, they they did this operation, but every time they moved a little too close to the edges, like a, a loud buzzer would go off? <sighs> yes. <laughs> wow. It's, they, thanks, it's thanks, a very thanks, trying time. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for your great yes ending there. <laughs> Always happy to apply. J- all, all of Jason's improv is uh, he will yes, but he won't and. <laughs> I have to sigh every time. <laughs> I'm a cop. Yes. <sighs> yes, you're a cop. Sure you are. <laughs> That's the end of the scene. All of Jason's improv scenes are 20 seconds long. <laughs> That's my that's my specialty. Just acknowledging what somebody is uh, reluctantly. Yes, that is the situation. God damn it! That's in real life too. If a police officer comes to me and says, "Yes, I'm a police officer," I'll be like, ah, "Okay, you're a police officer." <laughs> yeah. But Jason, this is a movie we watched. Yeah. Um. And I know you said that you 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 beautifully illustrated the fact that uh, this is a continuation of our uh, Hadrick series. I, on the other hand, am doing a uh, just a great job at tearing down everything around me. But why don't you uh, tell the folks, the folks listening, uh, maybe a little bit about? I mean, just you know, just b- briefly break down what this movie's about specifically. You said it's a, it's a plot to assassinate Hadrick, and then that's pretty much right at the yeah. beginning that he dies off screen. Exactly. Right? Hadrick shows up, we have a scene with Hadrick, and then he is quickly assassinated off screen, and we quickly learn uh, through the beginning of the movie that this guy, uh, Professor, uh, or sorry, not Professor, Doctor, Dr. Svoboda, who we don't know is yeah. he's under an assumed name at that point, is the person responsible for this, or at least... We assume this. It's made pretty clear to us by how this movie, you know, it's like, okay, that's the guy that did this. And a girl sees him and he basically ends up trying to find a place to stay. He meets this girl and her family and it leads to this family getting involved in this and they get arrested by the SS and taken to our, um, you know, taken to prison. And, and well, the father certainly is taken to prison and held as a hostage uh, mm-hmm. because the SS and, and this is based on real life. The SS said, look. You turn. We need the assassin now, or we're just going to start killing uh, Czech citizens in response. Mm-hmm. So, yep. and her, her father is among them, and so she's racing the clock to try to get to figure out a way to get her father um, out of trouble. Which at first is turning this guy in. She's kind of met him at first. She didn't know that he was the assassin, but she also figured it out pretty quick. Right? He kind of showed up at their house looking for a place to stay, and. Anyways, as time goes on, she does make one attempt to turn him in. She goes to the SS. <laughs> or is it te- well, she attempts to go to the SS, and we'll talk about that scene. That's a fantastic scene. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, she tries to turn him in, and that doesn't work. So eventually she starts working with him, and they come up with a crazy conspiracy that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I guess in terms of the movie works, where there is a guy that is part of the resistance meeting who uh, steps up at one point and is like, hey, maybe if we just turn the guy in, we can save all these lives. Wouldn't that be better to save all these lives and turn the guy in? Because I don't want to turn Dr. Zaboda in because mm-hmm. they're the resistance. They don't do that. No, no, Svoboda uh, is the one that's... Uh... Oh, sorry, well, you're also, saying they don't want to turn him in. He, he himself argues that he should turn himself in to mm-hmm. save all those lives, but... There's another guy that comes into a resistance meeting. He's part of the resistance. And he's like one of their money guys. And he's like, look, maybe we should just turn him in and save all these lives. Wouldn't that be the better thing to do? And they're all like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not mm-hmm. doing that at all. And it turns out this guy is working with the SS and he's been infiltrating the resistance. And um, so they, they uh, 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 Zavoda and then uh, uh, Ms. Novotny, mm-hmm. uh, who is the Masha. daughter, of, Masha, who is the like- daughter of... Uh, I kept Sorry. I kept thinking they were saying Marsha, and I was like, "That's a weird name for a Czech lady." <laughs> you thought they were all they all had thick Boston accents, and were saying Marsha, 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 <laughs> Marsha, chick on the potatoes. Yeah, no, um, uh, Marsha is a yeah, she he, she's the daughter of Professor Novotny, played of all people by the great Walter Brennan, mm, who whom, people if whom, you if whom's a guy that sounds like this, and he's playing this old time, he's playing this academic guy who's a Czech or something. I mean, doing a very different voice. Yes. 
doing uh, doing some 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 decent accent work. Yeah, but you could still hear Walter Brennan in there. It's like, oh, there's the old time. Because I at one point I was like, wait, is this guy an old time prospector? And then I looked it up and it was Walter Brennan. It's like, oh, he's the old time prospector. Yeah, he he's uh he's the guy that'd be like, you know, he'd be more worried about coyotes if I were you. Yeah, exactly. And for those of you it's wondering, um, for those of you wondering who we're talking about, this guy is in uh, Sergeant York. Uh, which is a movie we'll talk about eventually. But he's also in uh, My Darling Clementine, Red River, Rio Bravo. He's in a lot of westerns. If you've ever heard anybody used in a voice, it sounds like this. They're doing the riff on Walter Brennan. Mm-hmm. And that's probably what that Will Ferrell character. Gold in them hills. That's what? probably what that Will Ferrell character that never saw, yeah. uh, uh, that never made it to the oh. air um, is Absolutely. Uh, about. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Uh, yeah, so... So she so she hooks up with uh, with uh, Zavoda and decides that they're going to try to fuck over the SS and they do this whole ruse where they like pretend to be in love and stuff and they end up pinning everything on uh, uh, what's his name here uh, Chaka 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 who's the who's the he's their money guy he's like a beer manufacturer and they think they have everything pinned on him but it turns out that no uh, that's not the case. Oh wait, or it is. <laughs> no. So this movie's very complicated. No, this, so it this, is. This, it, this they they Chaka, do get him turned. The, the Chaka, Chaka guy. This Chaka guy is is you know he he's a double agent. He's helping the Nazis. Um, so they know this. They find this out, and then once they find it out, that's when they decide to turn the tables. And the way out of it was to make it look like he's the one that killed Hadrick. Yeah. yeah, and so basically they do eventually get away with it. But the twist is, is that it's too late. Yeah, Dad's already been executed. It's also, it's almost like a, you know what? I actually wrote down. It's, it almost is like an Ocean's Eleven caper at some point where they're yeah. like, they have all the townspeople that need to say a certain thing at a certain time yeah. and do, and you know, it's, it's probably actually one of the. I, honestly, this movie's not like necessarily fun because it's pretty, you know upsetting material but this is the the definitely like the fun sequence in the movie where he's just getting like all these people are like no he was never in my restaurant and he's and Chaka's like oh, 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 but I was there you know it's very yeah, much I like that yeah. he's and he's being gaslit hard so I understand okay. why he's so why he's so feels so nuts but then you don't you don't <laughs> feel too bad for him because he's a piece no, of shit no I mean he's a Nazi he's a Nazi collaborator at that mm. point so you can't feel too bad for him but also like in, in this from these 23 2023 eyes with the idea of what gaslighting is is that the, what this entire town is gaslighting this guy and that would be so fucking crazy to go through yeah and jason i gotta say right away and i know we usually save things like this for like after um we talk about the movie more specifically but i gotta say something about this movie really makes me happy and that's the fact that uh fritz lang by the way directed this yeah. movie which is crazy sure, the legend and what really makes me happy is he was in Germany, like, you know, leading up to World War II. He actually escaped and came to America. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's great is uh, the the Nazis actually tried to recruit him to make movies for them. And he yeah. said, yeah, sure. And then immediately caught the next, you know, whatever out of there and came to America yeah. and then immediately made this movie, yeah. <laughs> which I think is the greatest fuck you. Like, you could make propaganda movies for us. Sure, no problem. And then he made... Hangmen also die. <laughs> and and that comes through very clearly in the opening scenes where we get to see our one and only scene with Reinhard Heydrich. Now, if you'll remember in Conspiracy, folks, uh, we talked about the, the great Kenneth Branagh, who played Heydrich as a very refined, very educated uh, kind of guy, mm-hmm. very polite, very erudite, interesting, you know, interesting conversationalist, but also a fucking monster at heart. Uh, he's one of those psychopaths that has like a very, a very particular personality. Set that's of very skills. Charming. Oh, yeah, a very particular set of skills as far as manipulating people. But at heart, he's <laughs> a cold-hearted bastard who will do anything to accomplish his goal, which in this case is the elimination of all Jewish people. Now, now, are you saying that in this movie it's not that way? It's well, I'm I'm not saying that the same underlying attitudes aren't there, but those underlying attitudes have been taken from the underneath and then just grafted onto his face. Yeah. Uh, he he looks like a villain, like they have makeup on the mm. actor that's playing him, and it looks very severe. Like mm-hmm. if you look at a picture of Hadrick, I'm not going to say he's like a fucking model or anything, but there are certainly far worse looking Nazis than him. Yeah, Derlewanger. We'll talk about you. Don't you're not getting off on this. Yeah, watch out, um, Derlewanger. We both know who yeah. you are. 
we both know who you are. We're coming for you, buddy. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, he but they really make him look like a villain. And he comes out and he's ranting and screaming in German. Like they're really channeling like the the cartoon Hitler in him. Yeah, I uh, have... and there's at least in the copy I saw, there's no subtitles when he's speaking no. German. No, there's no subtitles so, um, because yeah. the, because the the and the point of that whole thing is that um, well, I think it's when he, cause he's. Yeah, it's when he's doing that, but it's also when um, I think a Czech uh, officer is speaking in his language, and Reinhard Heydrich is like, "What is that? What are you saying?" Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and 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 in this movie, uh, English stands in for Czech, uh, but everything else is in the proper language. It does, but I mean, that's that's not a huge that's not a huge bother, no. I guess, for me. It's that's a nineteen forties movie. It was made in America. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Exactly. I will Not say that um, he does. He does actually. He does remind me of like. There's like a Daffy Duck cartoon with Hitler, where Daffy yes. Duck is just like <laughs> abusing Hitler the whole time. It's great. I love that. Yeah. Oh, it's one of the best. It's it's back when Daffy Duck was still crazy. It's it and by the end of it, Hitler's like literally wearing a diaper and like sucking on his thumb yep. and everything. Yeah. yeah. It it does remind me of that. Although they do get across the unhinged uh, kind of attitude of him because he he comes in and intentionally drops his like little baton thing and yeah. stares at a soldier until he picks it up. Yeah. Who's like a, a, he's, he's a collaborating general. I think he's a guy he's working. He's part of the military that is it's Czech military, but it's, it's basically Nazi Germany's puppet military. Do, okay. I'm going to ask you this too, because I was wondering about that while watching this. Do you think they, do you think he was gay coded like 1943 gay coded? I got that a you little know what? bit. I I think I think I think just by coding somebody as German, often they get a little gay coded. I think that's just a a <laughs> trope that has existed for a long time. I don't think it was specific, but I think it just comes with doing German cartoon Germans in the forties. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought like his very like well mannered look and just the kind of he kind of had a little bit of a flamboyant delivery. Yeah. Um, Again, I, yeah. It, it, I will say though for this for this these brief moments we see this actor i think he's pretty good like even though he's basically a cartoon like his name is hans heinrich von twardowski is the actor's sure. name, that gentleman's name yeah um he he was in a, a a ton of movies but you know n never anything uh at this level most a lot of uncredited roles a lot of extra roles but this is definitely like the biggest thing i would say that he was in um but i think but i think <laughs> I don't know. He there's something he does kind of command the scene, you know, even with, for better or worse. He does. He does. He's the very uh, to the point where I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't see more of him. I kind of wanted to see a bit more of Hadrick yeah. before he got killed, or at least see him die on screen. Yeah, that would have been great. I mean, yes, absolutely. I, I I'm absolutely excited to see Hadrick die on. Well, to be fair though, Hadrick dies in his hospital bed on screen, so that's not terribly exciting. But I want to get to see him get shot. We, I'm and I'm sh Jason. We've got a lot of movies to go through with, with yeah. this, so I'm sure we'll see it at some point. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but yeah, yeah, Hadrick, uh, he's a real son of a bitch. He's um, a real son of a bitch. But yeah, um, so this performance, but but again, 1943, you're doing a kind of a propaganda leaning movie. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. you're gonna make him look like a fucking ma maniac, and it, uh, which he was a maniac. Don't get me wrong, but I but I don't think he was like goose stepping around and screaming all the time. Like, and I and I've said and I will say this, and I've said this before. If you're gonna do propaganda, this is the kind of propaganda I have no problem with. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with Nazis being made to look like fools. Let's just make Nazis look like idiots. Uh, Any that's time. fine. Yeah. Um, so I have to ask you this because this is like, you, you did touch on this a little bit and I'm sure we'll talk about it when we talk about the sequel to All Quiet on the Western Front. But was this not shortly after the era? I guess we're deep into World War II, but I think only a few years before this, they were, st Hollywood was still coddling Hitler a little bit, right? Yeah. Coddling well, Germany because much like China today, uh, Germany was a market that was very big and, 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 you know, very lucrative and Hollywood didn't want to mess with that. Now, there I don't was wanna, a lot of money to be made. Yeah. I don't want to get like too, too into it because I know in that episode we will dive into that because that's a big part of that movie. That's like the long road back or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and spoiler alert, we'll talk about that movie, but it, it is interesting to watch this and be like, well, clearly that era is over <laughs> at this point. Like, cause yeah. they are, they are taking shots left, right and center at the, at the Nazis. Yeah. I think actually Chaplin was one of the guys that really was at least did it in a big way with, uh, well, yeah. Cause uh, that was 1940, the great dictator. Yeah. And, th yeah, and that so that was before the U S was even in the war. 
And I mean, I don't know if you can, I mean, you know, say what you will, whatever, about the accuracy of the movie Chaplin, but I remember that being a pretty big plot point in the fact that he was making a movie making fun of Hitler and people weren't all that cool with it, weirdly. No. But it makes sense if you read... want to jeopardize their money. Yeah, it make, like I said, it makes sense if you read into the history. And, uh, I mean, you know, Charlie Chaplin, not a Hitler sympathizer. It's been it's been written. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure he was Jewish, number one. Yeah, um, that's a good reason to do it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have some characters in this movie. Don't know if you noticed. Uh, uh, we, we are talked you about... sure? Yeah. I watched a different movie then. I watched Fantasia. So we've got Zvoboda we already talked about. He's a doctor. He's working for the Czech underground, and he is the presumed assassin of Hadrick. Mm -hmm. So, in, like in real life, uh, even though we didn't know the details, they got the basically down as to how he died. He was attacked in his car. He was shot uh, through the car, or I think a grenade went off or something, and the shrapnel from the seat went into his body, mm -hmm. and he was you know pretty pretty injured, right? But they took him to a hospital, and he developed sepsis and died. Well, like you said, Jason. This movie was made four months after he died. We didn't really know much, right? No, they, like, they at least knew that much. They knew that's how he died, but that's pretty much all they knew. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure, and I'm sure we'll get to, like, as we get further in the years, I'm sure we'll get to something that's a lot, a, a much more accurate depiction of what happened. Mm -hmm. But this is very much oh, yeah. like, he died, he sucks, let's rally the troops, let's make this movie, fuck him. Yeah. I believe that's the tagline, so, actually. It should be. It should, should be. Man, that would have got people riled up. <laughs> Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, next war. Next war that happens, we'll use that slogan. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so yeah. So, then we've got so we've got Zabo Zaboda. He's our, he's our main character. Then we've got Masha, who is a girl who sees him in the street uh, running away from the Nazis. And when the Nazis come and ask her, where, where did he go? Where is the man? Uh, see? You can't help but code it gay. Um <laughs> He, she's like, oh, he went that way, and it was the wrong way. And very, eventually, very, that would come back to bite her again. Very Warner Brothers cartoony. And then, in a, in I guess a coincidence, he ends up coming to their apartment looking for a place to stay mm -hmm. uh, because his his room is he's not allowed to be there. He can't stay there, and he's on the run clearly. So he goes to this apartment, and it's where Masha is staying, and she lives there with her father, who is a professor. Uh, she lives there with her little brother. Uh, beta, and he's a little beta. Let me tell you, he fucking. <laughs> I don't know how old this kid's supposed to be, but he like cuts his hand and he cries like a little baby, like a little beta, like a little beta. That's right. Um, well, here's the thing too. This. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say there's also his her her fiance. She's a fiance named Jan, who I assume is Dutch. He kind of looks Dutch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta say, like this this stuff is the most interesting to me is that the the whole back and forth and like the morality stuff about like you know as the Czech people do we can do we convince this guy to turn himself in or is that like a worse thing to do because their fear is that he will be made example of and then yeah. nobody will step up after that i think that's at least one of their fears and yeah. and there's you know they're saying like you know is sure they're threatening to kill 400 citizens 40 at a time until the assassin is named but i mean <laughs> you know it's a it's a great great loss but do we do we sacrifice um i don't know do we sacrifice the fact that maybe and then and then after this maybe checks won't do anything like it's not like they knew they were going to win the war at this point i mean that's the thing is like and that and that is the struggle to imagine of any any person in that situation of a resistance situation it's it's a trade off it's like yes Maybe to save the most lives, we could sit back and just let this happen. Mm -hmm. But if we don't want this to happen anymore, we need to do something about it. And if people have to die for that, then it's going to be worth it when we're done. But that's a tough that's a tough thing to to weigh. I imagine in one's head, I I couldn't I, I don't even couldn't even consider what it would be like to be in that situation. And like, did Hatrix's death? And maybe it did. I don't. I'm like. Literally, I'm just asking. Pretend I know nothing. So just sure. re re regular everyday life about World War II. <laughs> um, did Hadrick's death really cause this much like uh, uproar and not up, not so much uproar, but kind of like a lack of cohesiveness among the Nazis and just a breakdown in their leadership, um, like it does in this movie, like it's represented in this movie. 
not that I'm aware of. I'd have to look, read a little deeper into it, but I don't. I mean, Hadrick was one piece of a, of a massive war machine, right? But a big one, right? He was he was a he was a he was a particularly important figure as far because he was the guy in charge of of Bohemia and Morovia, the protectorate that he, the worst, you know, which the, was Czechoslovakia, the worst Queen song, by the way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Bohemian Morovia. And he, um, you know, he was one of the primary architects of the Holocaust. He helped plan it. We saw that in Conspiracy. But I think by that point, most of his, like, evil really had been done. He certainly would have been able to commit more evil had he been alive. And there's a great book by Harry Turtledove that I, I don't know that I ever finished, but it's called The Man with the Iron Heart. It's a, an alternate history novel that posits, what if he didn't die? And after World War II... Hadrick was the was a guy that led like the after war resistance, like leading like basically like a an insurgency against the Allies, similar to like in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which would have been interesting. But yeah, no, uh, he definitely caused a lot of evil, and it was good that he died when he did. But I don't think it affected the Nazis' plans too much. I don't know that he himself was that important to the overall picture at that point because everything that he was required to do, he'd already done. Yeah, and maybe that's again that maybe that's tying more again more into the propaganda of this whole thing is that they're really trying to di drive home like this is a major loss uh, for the Nazis and kind of started destroying them from within. And oh, boys, if we if we stick with it two more years and we'll win. Don't get me wrong, I was only speaking on a practical level. Don't get me wrong, on a morale level, yes, losing Heydrich was massive for the Nazis because he was a major figure in Nazi culture. In, in that, you know, he was he was one of the number one Aryan boys. He looked the part. Like <laughs> he he was he was a poster boy essentially. And yeah, yeah, to have him die was a big blow to their morale, I imagine, but maybe I, not so much to their actual machine. You know what I gotta say too, because we already talked about how the ending. So at some point uh, Masha's father gets taken in as one of the one of the uh, hostages, whatever. Uh, one of the people they they take in, the Nazis take in the SS. Yeah, and he's one of the people that they're going to execute. And then they end up, you know, like you said, they end up they do end up executing him um, because it's too late to save him. Even though they manage to get Chaka uh, framed for killing Hadrick, but um, it's really interesting that this movie, while it, yes, it's very much in the vein of propaganda, they're also leaving a little bit of a gray area at the end, they're, you know, because her father still dies. And it's like, well, was that the right move? I don't know. You know, there's a little bit of a question or, mark there. I, I think it's more showing, in, again, it's a propaganda movie, so I think it's trying to demonstrate the inevitability of fascism, is that no matter what you do, no matter what they say, it's going to end up with people dead. And and your relatives specifically? Oh, we'll save them. No, they're not. They're not because because they don't care that the, their lives yeah. like that mean nothing to fascists. But it does go against the idea of propaganda a little bit because usually sure. in a it's propaganda, not a happy ending. yeah, exactly. Like that's that's what I'm thinking. Like usually in a propaganda movie, it's like rah rah rah. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we win. <laughs> and at least by the end of it, you have this overwhelming feeling of like we did it, and we do for a moment until then we see the the. The brutal, kind of brutal yeah. scene where they're all gunned down, like just one after the other. And it's actually, it, but but Brendan, I would argue too, it makes sense in a propaganda. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah, it's not what you would think of as a propaganda film, but this is a galvanizing type ending. This is an ending to send the audience away, going, "Fuck those fucking Nazis! We need to stop mm -hmm. them now." And that's going to encourage them to go out and buy war bonds and you know contribute to war production and maybe join up if they're of age, uh, desirable, like. Propaganda, baby. This is true. I also do think, though, that like this is the difference between propaganda movies directed by directors like Fritz Lang, yeah, as opposed to like somebody they had to hire quick to do a movie. Propaganda I mean, this is... can be like propaganda can be entertaining and and groundbreaking this if it's made the... by talented filmmakers. Yeah, this is the guy who directed like M. He directed yeah. Metropolis. He directed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the big heat. Like, this is not a yeah. guy who, ha who who just comes in off the street directing this movie. He directed Metropolis and, and M before this. And this movie is not a war movie at all. This movie is a noir movie. And it happens Definitely. to have the trappings of a war movie. Well, and that makes sense because Fritz Lang, like I said, The Big Heat is one of the, is yep. one of the most popular film noirs of that era. And it's very clear that this is a conscious decision that we're going to make this like a film noir. We want someone who knows what they're doing with a film noir. And that's very much Fritz Lang. And and what are the what is one of the major 
characteristics of a film noir is is uh, morality, is like a, a yeah. moral ambiguity. Uh, we talked about this in, in a few movies now, but that is one of the main things in film noir. Um, uh, certainly you have also the uh, <laughs> femme fatale, but I don't think Masha is the femme fatale. But yeah. <laughs> um, there, are, there are a lot of elements. Even the lighting is like a film oh, yeah. noir. For sure. Though know. oh, the shadows, like that scene where he comes in the door and you can see his long shadow being being cast as he walks in. Like, yeah, yes. very of the era. And that makes sense. That's and you think about that, that's Lang taking a, a form that is extremely popular at that time in pop culture and adapting it to the needs of, of the moment and to the propaganda needs of the government. And, um, and because yeah, it'd be like I don't know what would be the equivalent today. Like if taking like a big budget superhero movie and just making a straight propaganda movie with that, but with the same special effects and and kind of attention to detail that those movies have. Right, or like an A twenty four horror movie or something. Sure. L- like a like a like a midsummer type thing. Yeah, for sure. Why not? Um, but yeah, and they, there's there's so many key scenes that they use that that style so well in. Well, the one that sticks out for me the most. Um, is you like you said, uh, Masha is trying to keep up this uh, facade that her and Svoboda, who they know as yeah. Vanyek, th- that's yes. his fake name, the um, architect. Th- Again, going back to so many movies, decide to give their lead character the fucking position of an architect. A lot of romantic comedies, specifically, S- still happens to this day. Yeah, um, but they're <laughs> but she is uh, putting up the facade that they're having an affair, and. Yeah. There's a great scene where they come in, the, like the SS comes in and they pretend to be like, oh, you know, oh, you caught us in the middle of whatever. And they go to leave, but you, there's a shot under the door where you still see the one of the guy's shadows, like the SS officer's shadow. And she go, she doesn't see it right away, so she starts to go, why would you break up this li- – who are you to say who I can and can't be with? Like she notices it exactly. and then immediately keeps the facade up. And that's and that's yeah. not from being obvious. Like you don't see him on the other side of the door listening. You don't hear him mm. being like, "Oh, I better listen to see if that actually having an affair." You you get her you get her like just just the shot of the shadow of the feet under the door. That's all you yeah. need. Is that before or after the? Because there's one scene where they they do that, but where he has a piece of paper and he's like giving her instructions on the piece of paper of what to say out loud. That's an earlier scene. Yeah, that's also yeah. So really she's good. learned by that point, and yes, and, and by the end of the movie, they walk into the apartment. They know the apartment is bugged by the Gestapo, mm-hmm. and they start doing a scene essentially for the Gestapo to re- redirect them as have, as being lovers in a lovers' quarrel. Instead of you know spies and or, if, or assassins, and if we're going to talk about that, uh, Jason, we got to talk about the other big villain in this movie, and that's Gestapo yes. Inspector Alois Alois Gruber, played Alois. by Alexander Grunach. Yes, Alois Gruber is again another great noir character where he's like the, you know, where you have the private detective that's the hero, but then you have like the police detective that's the he's a corrupt police detective that is kind of one of the antagonists of the story, and this guy is definitely that he is an, an he is a, a corrupt Nazi police lieutenant. Oh yeah, and I like how he's kind of bumbling too, though. <laughs> like mm. he's kind of like like if he wasn't. A Nazi. If they didn't say he was a Gestapo inspector and he was just this asshole kind of cop, you'd be like, hey, he's kind of goofy in a way. But you're also drinks a like, lot of beer. He's yeah. always smoking cigarettes. He's just yeah, and he's fucking whores. Like he's a classic cop. He's a classic <laughs> cop. Although, and yeah. he does get a pretty brutal death scene too. Yeah. Well, I mean, he is smothered. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> um, but I, I just think I think he um. He kind of his performance is kind of like what that guy's doing with Hadrick. Like he's kind of over the top and stuff. But I think he's he's very much like a mustache twirling villain. But I think it works so well. Like I think he's a very a solid antagonist here. I think it's again. I think he's an appropriate villain to this genre of film at this time. I think he's yeah. What exactly what it, what the role calls for? Yeah. Um, oh, you wanted to talk about you, you mentioned earlier you wanted to get to it, but you said there's a scene where Masha at first when she uh, runs into Svoboda and figures out who he is, she's going to go to the Gestapo. Yeah, so she so she decides to go to the Gestapo, and while she's on the street, she gets confronted by. Is it is it him or is it somebody else? No, she gets confronted by she- like townsfolk. Well, well, but but what's what's the initial thing that because she says out loud, "I want to go to the, she just, I, I need to go to the SS headquarters." It's a dude. Gestapo. It's like it's like a Nazi that she says this to, right? And well, he he realizes it. So yeah, well, 
I thought the way the scene played out was that she was going and then somebody confronted her about it and somebody heard her say that she wanted to go to the Gestapo. And they're like, oh, you want to go to the Gestapo? Do you, you want to go to the Gestapo? And then a Nazi realizes this and comes over and is like, ma'am, you wish to go to the Gestapo? We can get you there. And, you know, it's clearly that everybody wants to, like, murder her because they think she's a collaborator at that point. That is a very interesting scene. Yeah. 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 I, they're, they're like, well, why would, why, you, would, why would you want to go to the Gestapo? I wrote that in my notes. I literally wrote that in my notes. Why would you say that out loud? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that is not a thing you want because we we've seen other movies. What happens after the war to collaborators? Uh, and maybe they don't know that that's coming for them. But... And and arguably, even people that might not have been collaborators or people that yeah, were it was a... uh, collaborators under threat of death of them or their family members, or they were collaborating in a way that they were attempting to sabotage or you know. Yeah. undermine the regime in some way. It may have been gray, but in the end it was black and white for some people. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of a lot of pent up rage at the end of that war. Um I love I love to the uh, there's a there's a montage. There's there's a lot of like there's quite a few modern filmmaking techniques in this and there's a great montage like it's where they're interrogating the family and they're all given the same story as uh, to show how well they prepared their um you know their bits or whatever. And then they do the same thing later during, like, I, again, I'm going to call it the Ocean's Eleven style scene, where they start uh, working their plan through the motions to get Chaka uh, pinned as the one that uh, killed Hadrick. And it's the same thing. They're going yeah. through and they're like, t- they're like adding to it. And he's like, oh, but I was in this restaurant at 3 p.m. And the, pr- the guy that owns the restaurant is like, look, I see him every day. I even put his table aside. He never showed up. Like stuff like that. And, and then he's like, to, like to the, 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 Goes to like to the the bus boy, just like surely you, you know I was there. I gave you a tip or something. He's like, no, you didn't do that. that was the day before. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you think, and at one point, I'm like, okay, cool. So this is gonna do the Ocean's Eleven thing, where where it just keeps going and going and going. Eventually, he's caught, but they almost turn it on its head because he uh, he seems to get the upper hand at one point. He 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 points out like a, a misspeak by someone, like she says she doesn't have a yeah. phone, but then she said she, she heard him call someone. Um, yeah. But then they just double down and just fucking fuck him over. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing that really does him out is that the, he has the gun in his desk. That is yeah. that gun. Plus, earlier in the movie, we'd seen Zvoda pocket his gold lighter that he had initially tried to bribe, uh, or well, suggested that he could bribe uh, Alois with, but he doesn't. But mm-hmm. yeah, he'd stolen his lighter and then planted it where they needed it so that the evidence was there. Yeah. Um, I like how they. I like how they flush him out. Do you remember this? How they get Chaka to like, and uh, basically how they find out that Chaka is working for the Nazis. They tell uh, a joke, right? They tell a joke because he claimed that he couldn't speak German at all. He didn't understand it. Couldn't speak it. And they tell this this German jo- or the the waiter is like, "Look, I want to tell you this joke, and it's really funny, but I have to tell it in German, otherwise it doesn't work." So he starts telling this joke in German, and apparently this joke was the same joke that was in the Monty Python episode. Uh, it's so funny that he can't help but laugh at it because he clearly does understand German. Jason, do you want to know what the joke is? <laughs> My dog has no nose. Then how does he smell? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I actually it? have what the joke oh, wh- is here. Wh- what is the translated joke? So the joke is, um, Adolf, we have food for five years. Five years? Really? Said the Fuhrer. Yes, five years, Goebbels says. And the Fuhrer said, I must tell Hermann Goering. No, by God, replies Goebbels, do not tell the Hermann. It's just the two of us, <laughs> you and me. So it's just a fat joke. <laughs> that is a great, f- and, and you know what? There's nobody better in the world to have a fat joke made about them than Hermann Goering. Yeah, fuck him. That's wonderful. So As literally, person, I approve. I just like how like that whole thing was just a fat joke, and it's the funniest fucking thing he's ever heard. It's it's a funny fat joke. It's a really funny fat joke. I'll give it to them. I understand why he laughed. <laughs> oh my god! Yes, I'm a getting big tub of lard. <laughs> he was. He was like, th- th- that's the funny thing, quick sidebar, that's the funny thing about Goering, like during the First World War, he was like a dashing pilot, mm-hmm. he was a German pilot hero, I-, I think he may, yes, he received the Blue Max, which was a Prussian award that was given out back then for, for merit. Um, and a movie and we're going to talk about. He famously didn't surrender to the Allies, he landed, he and his squadron landed their planes in Switzerland and just left them there and hiked back to Germany. Uh, so... So he was like, when he joined the Nazi party, that was a propaganda coup for them because it was this strapping lad who was, you know, just a, just a, 
personification of Nazism and, and the future of Germany. And then he and then he becomes a fat ass over time because he gets super rich and he gets access to one good wine and good food. Doesn't give a fuck. Starts wearing these ridiculous custom made uniforms that I found entrancing, but are also insane. Hmm. Uh, and he spent so much money and stole so much art from people and terrible things. And it's it's often forgotten that he had a brother. Uh, uh, I believe uh, who I think Albert Gary Gehring uh, was his br- no was, I think it was Albert Gehring who actually helped save a bunch of Jews during the war oh and is is remembered as a much better person although so, not remembered nearly as much as his un- uh, terrible brother so kind of like a tale of two cities situation here yeah sure yeah it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the fattest of brothers it was the coolest of brothers it was the best of times it was the blurst of times <laughs> That's right, folks. Check out The Simpsons on Disney+. Plus. Check it out. I don't know if you've heard of this. There's a new show on Disney+. Plus. It's called The Simpsons. Um, there's only a few yeah. seasons only on there. It's only been on for... There's only, there's only 35 seasons on there. Something like uh, that, so. yeah. If, if there's not exactly 35, you know, don't don't panic. It's probably just us not saying the exact number. Look, and at some time in the future, there will be 35, and then, and then people will listen back to this podcast and go, wow, they're right on. And then sometimes there'll be 36, or maybe even yeah. 37. Maybe even in a row? Maybe. Maybe in a row. Maybe in a row. I don't think Clerks is on Disney Plus, but maybe it is? Maybe in a row. Does does Disney own Miramax? Maybe in a row. Maybe in a row. Maybe in a row. In a row. Maybe in a row. In a row. I don't I think Miramax is still owned by uh Freeman Harvey Weinstein, is it not? I, I'm pretty sure they're owned by somebody else. It was because owned the by Weinsteins Weinstein. had their own wine. The Weinsteins had the Weinstein Company, right? Mm. I always like that they named it that because I could never tell who owned it. Well, that's it, and now you never forget. Never forget and that company can never be anything else. <laughs> yeah, you can't just call it like the Steen Wine uh, Company. Yeah, we all know. Ooh, Steen Wine. That does. I do love a good Steen Wine in the morning. A good steamed wine. Yeah. Are, yeah. are you are you a are you a red uh, a steamed uh, red wine drinker? No 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 no. I like a I like a steamed rosé. Oh, I like a steamed white wine. Of course like you a, do. Like a really like angry like a really a- angry Karen in her front yard with a shotgun. A steamed. Oh yeah. White no, that's wine. that's like yeah, that's like a steamed hock taller in the morning. That's like straight out of the bag. <laughs> yeah. Um. There's a really uh. uh disturbing moment here um this scene it's not really like graphic or anything because nothing is in this movie it was in 1943 but there's an off-screen moment where one of the hostages uh runs out and he's like no 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 you're not taking me and he runs out and he you hear him get shot and then the the Mm. ss officer calmly marches in and just continues exactly what he's saying he doesn't pause he doesn't make mention of it and it's it's pretty haunting it's a it's a really uh (laughs) strong moment it's reminiscent of uh, last week in Glory when he when the when uh, Colonel Montgomery shot the the black dude that was attacking the white woman and go oh I wish that if that if that secessionist just hadn't have provoked him I wouldn't have had to do that. Hmm. <laughs> um. My other my my last really like big thing here, Jason, is just nineteen uh, forties fight scenes. Man, what are you gonna do? Yeah. What are you gonna do? That's, I mean, and again, noir movies, right? It's it's expected, you know, the kind of swinging punches, and it's fine. Just it's fine. It's, I, it's it's what it's what makes the movies the movies. I I just like I just like the sound effects. It's just like it sounds like people are just like slapping ham, like just <laughs> slaps in the face. People yeah. do twirls before they fall. Yeah. You know? Do you twirl before you <laughs> fall, Jason? Do I twirl before I fall? Mm. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. The other day I fell, but I just fell on my face. But you so. didn't twirl. No, no, I went right down. Were you Were you embarrassed just because you didn't twirl? You know what? I've fallen down enough times in my life that I no longer get embarrassed. I just laugh at myself. I'm not saying you're embarrassed because you fell. I'm saying, are you, were you embarrassed because you forgot to twirl first? No, I, no, I laughed at myself because I forgot to twirl. Because oh. what the fuck else am I supposed to do when I fall? I'm supposed to twirl, you're and I didn't to do twirl. it. You didn't do it. No. Was, was driven into my head as a child in university, <laughs> when I was in university as a child, uh, because I was sent to university initially. You were sent there. Realized that, 
Yeah, no, I was sent there. I was sent to university at the age of five wow. because they thought I was super smart. And then I got there and I was just like coloring stuff all the time. And they realized that, no, the mistake had been made and I was sent back to regular school. A real big assumption that they made there. Just because you, I know, you, didn't, I know. They, just because you didn't color outside the lines on a dragon uh, picture. Uh, I think there were not very many smart kids in my area and they were really excited. And it just didn't work out. You didn't eat the crowns. That made you stand out. That's right. <laughs> I, I kept the glue on the page and not on my tongue. Right, right. At least around people, eh? But you, I used you to did put the glue thing. On my fingers and rub it around. Yeah, you did fun. the thing where you put Elmer Elmer's glue between your hands and you made nice little fucking. Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You let it dry. You let Elmer's glue dry you, are, between your hands, and then are, are you implying that I fucked my hands full of Elmer's glue, Jason? I'm just implying that you put Elmer's glue on your hands until it dried, and then it looked cool. Oh, I, well, I would put it on my fingers and then rub it together, and then it would turn into, like, plastic. That's what I mean. But you do it on your hands, yeah. and it's like a big plastic yeah. piece. It's crazy. It's crazy, man. You have a fuck with Elmer's glue, kid? Oh, that Elmer's glue smell, man. You can't you can't get past that. That's classic. Yeah, I love that new Elmer's glue smell. Jason, those are all the big things I have to say about this movie. Anything else you want to mention before we get into our bits and our bombs? You know what? I always save my notes for bits and bombs, so let's wait for bits and bombs. Well, then we'll take a brief break, and we will be right back. Age Radio. Heydrick. It's the second Heydrick. Reinhard Heydrick. We gotta talk about the Heydrick. It's time to bits. It's time to bombs. It's time to bits and bombs about the Heydrick. Bits and bombs about the Heydrick. Heydrick bits and bombs. Go now. Go, Jason. Don't wait for me to finish. Just start. I have a really nice... I wish I could show you this, folks, because we're not a video podcast, but I'm looking at a really nice, <laughs> a really nice imposing shot from early in the movie of a, an SS officer standing in front of a picture of Hitler. Hitler looms over top of him and it's like it's like center it's it's like right in the center of the frame and there's a swastika above Hitler's head and the officer is flanked by swastika flags it's like Fritz Lang you really could have made some good Nazi propaganda films if you'd have been there and I'm I'm thankful you didn't I literally wrote my notes when I saw Heydrich dudes going all out so that lets you know what kind of performance that is um the uniforms in this movie Brendan not great not great. They're uh, you know they're in the ballpark, uh, but a lot of the eagles are too big. The the helmet decals don't look bad. It's clear a lot of their helmets are World War One era helmets, especially on like extras and stuff. They're they're much much more much more wider, and kind of kind of older looking. Uh, so you know again middle of the war. It's not like they had a, a direct uh, uh, connection to Hugo Boss to ship them uniforms or anything. So they did what they could, but eh, not great. Not great. Um, did you notice? Yeah. Yes, I did. Did you notice yep. that um, there was a scene where we have a Nazi who I believe must be Austrian because he sounds exactly like Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, I did. I missed that. <laughs> There's a scene where they're in a theater and uh, a rumor starts being passed around that Hadrick had died. Hadrick mm. had died. Hadrick had died. And everybody starts whispering. And then and then everybody starts applauding, right? And all of a sudden, some guy's like, turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. And then he turns the lights on. And who in here said that David, uh, who, was, uh, who was applauding Hadrick's dead? And it was like, this guy sounds like Schwarzenegger. So I do assume he must be an Austrian Nazi. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 a, that's a pretty uh, interesting scene too, because uh, they they just go up and give him one of those nineteen forties punches too. Um, yeah, <laughs> I I just completely knocks him out. What I noticed, um, I noticed something weird, and I don't I don't think this is the case, but you could see at one point there's an ad for Mercury cigarettes, and sure, I noted, I th it, the the girl who plays Masha. Looks exactly like that girl in the Mercury cigarettes ad to the point where I thought that was a bit and that they cut from her to Masha. And I was like, wait, are they saying that her job is like she's in advertising? Like she's a model? Like, is that what we're saying? And then I thought, well, maybe that's the case, but then they don't ever really mention it. But then I'm also like, uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It just, she had the well, same hat for God's sakes. See, I think a cigarette ad at that time would feature a lady who emphasized purity and the cleanliness of their wonderful tobacco. And so by showing that picture and then contrasting it with her, it's, it's telling us that she, she is also as pure 
and clean as the tobacco that Mercury provides for its loving customers. Yeah, that's probably what it was. I, th- I think so. Jason, do they have little uh, street oh. tanks? Yeah, little, little like armored cars. They were yeah, cute. For sure. They were really cute. They are cute. They are cute, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Operating on streets and stuff where tanks are maybe too big and you're trying to deal with crowds of people. Yeah, it'd be useful to have a little armored car like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we didn't mention him yet, but there's a cab driver who figures into this plot mm. uh, briefly. And for some reason, again, so we are operating under the assumption that English is Czech in this movie, right? Yes. And this guy speaks Czech. <laughs> but they cast this guy, and he's clearly just playing a New York cab driver. Oh, yeah. He what are you talking about? He's like, oh, I ain't seen nothing, bro. I ain't seen nothing, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Oberschattenfuhr. Also, do they claim that he, instead of revealing what he knew, he killed himself? Because when he jumps through the window, I didn't think he was jumping that high. I... Yeah, that was my thought, too, and maybe that was just it wasn't clear, but I think that was the implication that he jumped through the window to his death. Okay, okay. Even though it looked like he just, like, jumped out, like, a first-floor window. Yeah. <laughs> he should have popped up and took off. That's what I thought. It reminded <laughs> me of that SNL bit where Jason Sudeikis jumps out of the window and just lands on his feet immediately and then just brushes himself off and walks away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there's a, okay, there's a reference to something here really quick, and maybe you could – I'm sure you could tell me what this is, but someone references – um. A student massacre at the university. What is that a reference to? Do you know? I mean, I'm not sure because the only the, the massacre that I'm aware of is the Lidditch massacre, which happens as a reprisal for um, Hadrick's death, and it's and it's all the men in this village are. Which may I think this is sort of portrayed in this movie. I don't know if it's exactly the Lidditch massacre, but well, kind of because this that, village wasn't that the retaliation with the with the. All it was the, one of the, reta- the It was at least one of the retaliations. Yeah. It was at least one of the retaliations where they took 184 men or something from the village, killed them all, and then shipped the women and children off to a concentration camps where most of them were killed, uh, uh, women and children, at some point. Yeah. Well, they do they do the start of that anyway because they're like you know we're gonna kill 40 people every what is it, like every every hour every 20 minutes or something where where the assassin's yeah, name is like not that. mentioned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that was kind of German that was German practice in World War II and actually throughout a lot of history is if you especially in your recent years with like when European nations have had kind of rules of war, partisans are considered fair game for whatever. Mm-hmm. Soldiers in uniform are considered worthy of, you know, prisoner of war rules and, and the legal rules of war, but Civilians who are attacking soldiers out of uniform are considered fair game to basically just be executed. Jason, I also have to give credit to the guy who told that Hitler joke because he did it with prop yeah. work. He even gave himself a little mustache. <laughs> he did. He did. You got, I mean, exactly. You got to respect the commitment to the bit. That's the, it's, it's maybe the, he, maybe he parted his hair a little bit when he did it. The, you know? the check care top. The the ch- check it <laughs> top care check top. I got nothing. I don't know. I don't know what carrot is in the check language. Carrot but... check. Care to Top. Sure. <laughs> Let's see more notes. Uh, I, so they they they're talking about the person like there's a lady that works in their building that clearly oversees everything. And when I think of that, I think of like a superintendent. They keep referring to this lady as our janitress. Oh, I didn't catch which, that one. Which I like the the female form of janitor is janitress, <laughs> janitress. which that makes sense because janitor is definitely a male uh, gendered term, right? <laughs> Well, and, but but some of them are like because um, like some terms we don't think of, but they technically do have, like like wouldn't it be doctress, like a doctor but that's and a so doctress? St- but that, I mean that's stupid though. Like oh it, yeah, doctor- no, it, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense anymore. Honestly, it's even when there were gendered words. O- honestly, like dominator, it, dominatrix. But it's honestly, it's even like when people say actor and actress. I'm like, I just call everyone actors. Like I don't really think at this point. Yeah, it's like why? Why are we saying? Uh, even at the even at the Academy Awards, I don't even think it's called Best Actress anymore. I think it's just called Best perf- Best Performance by a Leading uh, female, female or something like that. Yeah, I mean, really, at this point, the gender differences only exist for the awards purposes. But then again, if we didn't do that at the Oscars, you know that every year it would be the same white guy, uh, white, same white yeah, guy, same winning. white guy. Yeah. And oh, and maybe Denzel. Denzel is the one that has the outside chance for sure. Yeah. He's, he's just too good. Yeah. Uh, Morgan Freeman, certainly for the supporting. Um, <laughs> wow. Just is that it's sort of a <laughs> no, slam? No, I'm just saying that. But no, it's not a slam. Okay. But like what movies has Morgan Freeman like full on like top of the bill starred in? 
mean, Shawshank Redemption. No. Miss Daisy? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Bruce All Might. No. Uh, let's see here. I got, uh, uh, Batman Begin. No. There uh, must have been one. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Kiss the Girls. I guess. Okay. And yeah, I guess sort of seven. Along Came a Spider. I guess he's the main character with Brad Pitt. So, seven. so only, so only great movies where he's the lead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. They, of course, in the Nazis, their usual thing: we're going to execute, you know, everybody. Wait. If you hide the assassin, we'll kill your whole family. Wait, Jason, I just thought of one where he's the lead. March Which of the one? Penguins. Oh. He's the narrator. Well, he's the narrator, isn't he? <laughs> he's the narrator. Yeah. Is, he's that, is that considered the lead? <laughs> if you are the narrator, you are the lead of the film. That's why in North, uh, whoever the narrator is, <laughs> North, I'm trying, I can't remember, but they're the lead. Uh, that's why the lead the lead actor in Arrested Development, of course, is Ron Howard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, narrator. The narrator in North is Bruce Willis. How could I forget that? He plays the Easter Bunny, too. Great movie. North, don't yeah. watch it ever. It's terrible. Yeah, no, no. I saw it as a kid, and even then it was like, this isn't good. I saw it only um, once as an adult, and I was mad. <laughs> the vegetable lady got interrogated. The lady that was selling vegetables to uh, to uh, Marsha, Masha. Under, underrated performance by her, too, because she looks genuinely yeah. terrified that they're going to kill her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was like this jolly vegetable lady, and then, yeah, she's completely fucking yeah. destroyed in the scene we see her in. But she keeps her mouth shut. You know, that's the you know that's the woke version of the jolly green giant. It's the jolly vegetable lady now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have anything, Jason, uh. us men. Oh, so here was my thing. So I remember I, I talked about beta was a little beta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think so. I thought when uh, when Dad goes to be taken off to be executed, rather than giving his little baby Beta a hug, he gives him a firm, manly handshake. And I don't think Beta is to a point where he deserves a firm, manly handshake. He deserves a little hug. He's such a Beta cuck. Also, I don't care how manly you are. If your dad's being taken off to be executed, give him a hug. <laughs> now, now, young man, I'm I'm just gonna get a bullet in the head. A handshake is all I need. I don't know why I'm Sean Connery all of a sudden. <laughs> You know, of course, Boda has his crisis of conscience. He wants to um, turn himself in to save all these lives, but uh, his uncle tells him, uh, "Look, man, you got no right to surrender here. This isn't about you. This is about the movement. We can't surrender you." Mm-hmm. Don't listen to Chaka. I think he's and got a secret. You know what? Maybe that's maybe that's part of the point. To, to have the Nazis execute these civilians, part of it may be to galvanize the rest of the population to do something about it to get into the resistance to fight these guys because mm-hmm. it's like this can happen to you next if you don't do something about it yeah do you think they care if they actually find out who did it maybe they'll kill them anyway we no. don't know they don't give a shit no oh right okay so we were talking about her going to the shop headquarters it was because she got into a, a cab and the cab driver is working with the resistance, and she asked to go to the Gestapo headquarters, and he wouldn't take her there. He took her somewhere else. And so she started yelling and got out of the cab, and, and that's when people started being like, hey, you're going to the Nazi headquarters, are you? And then the yeah. Nazi showed up and saved the day. Yeah, they were all Dennis Miller gangsters, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, you're going to the Nazis, uh, <laughs> are you? cha 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 chi I wrote, uh, but some helpful Nazis saved the day and get her there. Also, they beat the fuck out of a shop boy mm. with clubs. I just picture um, Dennis Miller, if he was in this movie, he'd be like, uh, yeah, Adolf loves Eva, babe. Loves her. Cha-chi. And then if you're promptly shot. <laughs> we, we see a sign at one point that says, he who serves Hitler serves Germany. He who serves Germany serves God. Wow. See that? See that connection? Oh, yeah. Okay. German. It's uh, it's Hitler, then it's Germany, then it's God. Oh. Keep in mind, they're all together. Oh. Uh, a German in the movie literally shouts, We don't make mistakes here! Yeah. <laughs> Checks marvelous people to go along with this uh, conspiracy. Um, they do that whole thing with the bug. That's pretty cool, where they, they try to fuck over... Uh, uh, Jaka by pretending, you know, to throw them off with their lover's quarrel. Gruber. Gruber. Gruber said that? No, they fuck over Gruber, the Gestapo inspector. Yeah, Gruber. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
uh, at one point, Chaka is confronted and he tries to get away and he starts eye gouging people like he's in a ring, mm. <laughs> which I thought was great. Do you think? Uh, <clears throat> do you think Roddy Piper, uh, young Roderick Toombs, was watching and got inspired? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, little Rod- known Roddy fact, Piper. Little known fact: Roderick Toombs, not the son of Ernie Coombs. Uh, I know their last no. names rhyme, but I just wanted to let everyone know that. Yeah, in Canada, uh, a rhyme does not indicate that you are related to something. I know that's how it, I know that it's what it, what it's like in a lot of Nordic countries. If you get my drift, but down here, babe, no, same last names only, only. Bjarni Hertz and his his brothers with Njarni girls. Exactly, like, it, and if you change your last name, it also means you no longer are related by blood. Like that's how it works down here. Your your genetics shift. <laughs> yep. I don't like uh, talking about genetics and we're discussing a movie about World War II, but let's keep going. Fair, fair. <laughs> so they have that scene where they're hiding hiding the uncle in in their room, right? Mm-hmm. And it's actually a pretty cool scene because he's hidden behind the curtain, which I didn't even realize right away until we see the blood dripping down mm. from under the curtain onto the paper. So Svoboda, the clever fucker that he is, he's like, uh, would you guys like a drink? And he's like, I'm going to go get us some wine. And he goes and gets some wine. And as he walks into the room, he intentionally trips and throws his wine at the like newspaper that has the blood on it so that it hits it and stains the whole thing so they don't notice it. Mm-hmm. Very oh, clever. Yes. I really like that. Mm-hmm. Really like that. Also, but kind of silly they didn't check behind the curtains. No, oh, what are you going to do? It's curtains. Nothing's back there. Yeah. That's the thing about curtains, Jason. There's never anything behind them. I also saw, uh, uh, remember how I said earlier the uniforms were a bit rough? Yep. At one point there's a scene and there's an SS banner behind everybody and the proportions are all wrong. The SS ruins. It's like, guys, you have pictures of the SS banner. You could make it proper. Jason, it was. Like I know. I know they didn't have the internet in the '40s, but if you're going to do it, you could make this banner properly with the proper proportions on the runes instead of looking like some skinny fucking knockoff. Well, they did have internet. The only thing is, it was ExploreNet. That's true. Ugh. Yeah, it was really slow, even on the ENIAC. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, then we see a Nazi at one point who inexplicably has a huge zit on his face. <laughs> I don't know. He's He's got like the fashy haircut and the glasses, but he's just got this massive zit on his cheek. I would have loved it. They had shown a scene just before that of him like getting ready and looking in the mirror and just you, see, you hear like his inner monologue. And he's like, imagine the no. big day, the big day with the Fuhrer and, and I get a pimple. I get the fucking people on my day with the fewer of as an oxyclean when you need some. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, uh, 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 Gruber clobbers. Uh, I, I, so at one point, Jan and Gruber get into a fight, uh, the fiance, and Gruber hits him with a piece of firewood. And it's like, how is he not dead? I he thought he killed him. I thought he firewood. killed him in that scene, too. Especially in yeah. old movies, you could li- literally, yeah. like, hit someone in the gut with a bowl and they would die. <laughs> so like, exactly. It, it's sometimes hard to judge how, how hard they've hit someone in an old movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, I literally watched a movie. Yeah. I watched it. I watched it. Uh, it's a great movie, but I finally watched the original uh, The Invisible Man in uh, 1933. And there's this, there's a scene where Claude Rains literally just, like, kicks a dude kind of hard in the gut and he falls over and then the, the newspaper report is like, brutally slain police officer. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Was he? Did he have? Was just, did he have Achilles' heel in his stomach? Or did he? It was like some fucking like like something that burst or something like a swollen appendix that burst when he kicked. Yeah, him let me like, just say this: if somebody yeah. gets kicked in the gut and they fall over and immediately die, you didn't kill them. <laughs> and we had a whole thing with with Zvoda where he was his alibi was that he was in surgery. Uh, but there was also another 40s handsome guy that looked similar to him with a mustache and a, and a good haircut. I was very confused had, uh, by that. I didn't know which one to shoot. Yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, of course, they wear masks in surgery because in the 40s they knew that masks had some use to them. And, weird. Uh, yeah, weird. But So, yeah. So, long story short, the movie ends and it's sad because Dad still gets executed anyways. The Nazis are the Nazis and that's the life in the Reich. That's the life in the Reich, and that song plays. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a it's a surprisingly jaunty tune for the subject matter. Um, yeah, there you go. That's uh, okay. Well, there you go. There's your, there's your bits and bombs. Do you have any other bits and uh, bits and bombs you want to lay out, or is that it? 
No, that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, do you want to hear some of the titles this movie uh, almost had, some of the working titles? Oh, please. I love this. Okay. These are some of the titles. Never Surrender. Okay. No Surrender. Yeah. Uncom- well, yeah, because of the song. right? Oh, we didn't mention that. One of the guys is a poet, and he, he, he writes this poem, and he hands it off to – there's like a famous writer in the in the, in the the prison with him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, I'll take a look at that. And then he's like, here, if you could help me fix it. And he reads through it, and he's like, no, this is perfect. And so by the end of the movie, they're singing this poem as a song, and it's called, like, No Surrender. Uh, we also have Unconquered, uh, okay. Trust the People. Lest We Forget, okay. which is a weird thing to that's, call that movie. No, yeah, that's more of a World War One movie title. But also, it's also like weird because the movie's about Hadrick's death and we're like, Lest We Forget. Nope, I don't like well, that. And let, lest We Forget the victims that suffered because of Hadrick's But it death. sounds like, because the movie's about yeah. Hadrick's death, it has a weird yeah, tone to it. And then it my favorite weird, one, weird. <laughs> We Killed Hitler's Hangman. <laughs> I like that it's direct. Um, however, uh, the producers held a contest for the cast and crew to suggest a new title. And the contest was won by a production secretary who uh, received a $100 prize. I am very curious to see what $100 was in 1943. So I'm going to find out right now. Uh, you know what? 100, 100 bucks in the middle of World War II? I think that's a pretty good payday. Let's see. That's that's That makes your life a little easier that week. $1,767 approximately yeah that's pretty sweet you you go to work and you suggest title and they're like hey here's two thousand bucks have a good day yeah um so this movie was uh the the guy who wrote who was credited with writing the story bertolt brecht this is his only american film credit although he supposedly worked on other scripts during his time in hollywood without receiving credit he wait you mean the same guy that wrote like the pen ten penny opera and shit like uh, i don't know Maybe. Or three penny opera, yeah. Okay, yeah. He's the guy that wrote the three the three penny opera. Yeah. yeah. So another famous German German intellectual that I believe left. Uh, yeah. Germany during World War Two. The thing is, though, uh, so he so he did work on other scripts during his time in Hollywood without receiving credit, but he also later left the United States after testifying before the House of Un American Activ- Activities Committee. That whole thing. Um, and another guy named John Wexley received sole credit for writing the screenplay after giving evidence to the Writers Guild that uh, Brecht and Fritz Lang had only worked on the story. However, a lot of people believe that uh, Bertolt actually wrote, did write most of the script. Um, apparently the judge Probably. that was on the case said it was obvious to the jury that Brecht and not Wexley was the main author, and that Wexley furthermore had a reputation as a credit stealer, but only because of the fact that only written evidence was admissible, and since only Wexley's name appeared on all the drafts, the jury had to rule in his favor. Wexley was also blacklisted later after he was named a communist in the HUAC hearings. God, this fucking country, <laughs> those people. The idea, the very idea that workers might organize to fight for their own rights, and all of a sudden you're a communist, you motherfuckers. I know, at least the world is better now. Um, <sighs> Hangman Also Die had a world premiere in Oklahoma, an event which featured Adolf Hitler, Hirohito, and Mussolini being hanged in effigy on Main Street. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I thought that it's was like, good. It's like when you go to a – when I went to see episode one uh, when I was in ninth grade, uh, uh, some a, a gentleman who was a student teacher when I was in elementary school and his brother performed a lightsaber duel outside the theater uh, uh, as Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. So I feel like that's kind of the equivalent for – uh, this film and era that they hang them in effigy. It's exactly <laughs> the same. Yeah. Um, so a few little bits of trivia. I mentioned Huac. Um, you, this will not surprise you that during the Joseph McCarthy Red Scare era, this was one of the films labeled as subversive by the Huac um, oh. because it was alleged to have contained dialogue that might be construed as pro-communist. Um. This is actually, there's a surprising bit in this movie where uh, Masha is actually in a little bit of undress. That scene where she uh, pretends to be caught in the act with um, Svoboda. She's wearing a lot less than was accepted in most American movies at this time. And they think the theory is that it got past the censorship board because the scene is them trying to, uh, part of a ruse against the Nazis. So I think that they, they saw that and looked past that a little bit. Um, because well, in most of that scene, she has a blanket in front of her that she picked. But up. even then, Jason, that's pretty risky. Yeah, I'm just saying sure. you saw her shoulders, is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I, oh, 
But you imagine, imagine how much cum they had to clean up in the theaters after they showed a woman's shoulders on a screen. Can you imagine, like, when people first saw nudity for the first time in a movie, they must have been like, "Wow, the world sure is changing." You were right, Bob Dylan. Um, <laughs> as he was, just, they just <laughs> whipped it out right then and there. Was that what he was singing about? <laughs> What well, times they were changing. I, you could just go outside and pull out your dick and swing it around. Okay, Jason, I'm not talking about real nudity. Bed. I'm talking about movie nudity. I watch the ladies up on the screen and swing my dick around until the <laughs> It doesn't scene. mean you can jerk off in the theater. Oh, it's spinning and going and spinning around. What a mess I've made. Oh, the times are gone. Wow, you know that song front to back. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, part of the final Nazi report about the assassination reads as follows. However, the in- uh, this is in the movie. However, the investigation proved beyond all doubt that the aforementioned Chaka cannot have been the assassin. But in view of the fact that the sharpest terror failed to force the people to denounce the real assassin, we are compelled to save the face of the German occupational authority and choose the lesser evil by accepting Chaka as the assassin and thus close the case. I guess that's what it says yeah. in German if you uh, read the report at the end. Yeah, which makes sense. And the Germans would have absolutely done that. I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. It was about, it was about, uh, they didn't want to seem like they didn't solve the case. Oh, yeah, he did it. We solved it. It's good. Jason, this movie goes to the Oscars. Ooh. It is nominated for two Oscars. I'm not even going to get you to guess because they're like old timey names and you won't, <laughs> you won't know is the it, categories. Uh, the fi- finest portrayal of Aryan uh, supremacy. Nope. <laughs> no, <laughs> wait. They, I, wait. They they got rid of that. Uh, they got rid of that after 1941. Right. That's when Hollywood stopped calling Hitler. No, they've got. Yeah. So it's nominated for two Oscars and it doesn't win. It's nominated for best music scoring of a dramatic or comedy picture. That's the name of the, the category. Uh, that of course goes to the song of Bernadette. And wait, well, what's what's the other option? Like, I guess a musical. Well, th- best sound, comma recording, and that of course goes to okay. This Land Is Mine. There is no uh, bath. That's like the opposite of uh, that's the opposite of that Woody Guthrie song. This land is your land. This land is mine. It's land. The, yeah, I'm assuming it's the Nazi version of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this land is mine. Um, no Baftas because they don't exist yet. No excuses. Win some Baftas, guys. Come on. Um, but the budget for this movie is impressive. And again, we're talking 1943 money. And I'm gonna again, I'm gonna find out what this is right now. But the budget for this movie in 1943 was eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh wow! So what's that in uh, what's that in twenty twenty three dollars? We're gonna, we're gonna find go out and find out. We're gonna find out right now, Jason. I'm gonna find out right now. Let's see. It is the equivalent to fifteen million nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. Now maybe I'm just gonna float a guess here. Maybe Wikipedia is just saying that's what it would be now. Maybe that's what the, maybe that's what it is because I don't know if this is fifteen million. Well, I mean, million fifteen dollars. million nowadays. No, but fifteen million nowadays would be a pretty modest, like mo- like mainstream feature but film. Isn't that like right? it wasn't Gone with the Wind less than that? I can't see this having a bigger budget than Gone with the Wind. But also, Gone with the Wind was in nineteen thirty. Well, wait, let me let me see. Mm, Gone with the Wind. Jason, stop searching for Gone with the Wind on eight chan. <laughs> I gotta see my Gone oh, with okay, the Wind. Okay, Gone with the Wind three point eight five no, million. No, the oh so. Yeah, three point eight five million in nineteen thirty nine or whatever it was. If, so if that's eight hundred sixty thousand, fifteen million, like that's like I say, fifteen million is a pretty modest budget uh, uh, mainstream movie today. So yeah. the equivalent in nineteen forty three seems reasonable. Okay, I'll buy that for a dollar. But there wow. you go. That's um. That's the stuff. That's the stuff about the backstage, behind the scenes, the making of the films and the pudding pops. But Jason, tell me, um, this is our second Hadrick episode. What would you think? This was an interesting movie. I like this movie. It's a, I love a, a good noir and it's an entertaining noir. It's maybe not the go-to movie that I would want to recommend to someone to learn about Hadrick's death, but it is definitely a good supplemental film once you kind of are familiar with that story. Uh, I could see its point during World War II. Um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting, an interesting oddity in a lot of ways because there's not too many war movie or rather noir movies that that kind of go like this. That they're like a war movie grafted onto it, so it's interesting that way. Uh, and yeah, I, I recommend checking it out. But like I say, I think there, I think we're going to come upon movies that are better representations of the story that we're looking into. Yeah, I, I, 
I think as like a Hadrick movie, and again, I don't know a lot about him other than the movie that we saw previously, but as a Reinhardt oh, Hadrick yeah. movie, it feels like kind of a failure, but as a movie, but just as a Fritz Lang film noir uh, wartime movie, I think it's, I think it's yeah. pretty solid. Like he does, uh, Fritz Lang is yeah. obviously, a, was obviously a very good director. Um, he, he know he's done this genre before he's a, he's an old hand at it. Um and I think it's a solid solid movie. I, I like like you said. I'm in agreement though. I don't know that I go to this as like a historical uh, representation of the, of this era even. Not even just Hadrick, yeah. but of this era in general. Um, it, and that's the thing about this movie, Brendan, is that it's a movie that is like in it, it. It's kind of suspended in in purgatory. Like it's a it's an interesting movie, but it's like if you were to say, oh, I want to show you a noir movie. I would have a better choice from this. Probably, you know, even from the category of, of you know, Fritz Lang's filmography, pick a better noir movie. Yeah. I want to show you a war movie. I can find a better war movie about Reinhard Heydrich. I want to show you a, a movie about uh, uh, people dealing with executions in war. I could probably show you a better movie. But this is a good, but this is a movie that at the time served the exact purpose that it was made for. Yeah, and like I said, like it's not. Yeah, like exactly. It's it's not trying to be. I don't think it's trying to be a super historical uh, take on Reinhard Heydrich by any stretch. Um, it's just trying to you know get the people happy that uh, they murdered a, a a big piece of shit. And to piss those people off, did they did they keep murdering checks regardless? And again, Fritz Lang, hero, by responding to, "Will you make propaganda movies for us?" by making the least propaganda movie for the Germans by making this movie. Um, exactly. But yeah, there we go. So that's it. Uh, that's our little our little venture again into the Hadrick Files. We are going back to the list again for a little bit uh, next week. Um, now next week, Jason, we are jumping all the way to 1949. And uh, oh. we've got a, a movie coming up by a filmmaker directed by Henry King. Jason, what do we have coming up? Brendan, we have a movie that is, uh, when it comes to movies about uh, planes in the sky, you can't really talk about those sorts of movies without mentioning 1949's 12 O'Clock High, starring what I can only assume is Gregory Peck. You are correct. Um, the Thank movie uh, reads as follows. In the early days of daylight bombing raids over Germany, General Frank Savage, played by Gregory Peck, must take command of a hard luck bomber group. Much of the story deals with his struggle to whip his group into a disciplined fighting unit in spite of heavy losses and withering attacks by German fighters over their targets. Sounds again like uh, a wartime take on Bad News Bears. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> That's fine by me. This And this is going to be interesting because this is a harrowing time. Daylight raids were incredibly dangerous for bombers because they could see you. The whole point of a daytime raid was so you, you could see what you were bombing, right? So you could target... You know, military infrastructure and stuff, which is why eventually later in the war, they stopped doing that. They started doing nighttime raids and they just dropped bombs wherever because it was safer for the planes. Um, I will also say it's interesting because we are now out of the, uh, we're 1949. So we're removed from the war for, by a few years. So we'll see what yeah. kind of changes here, um, you know, as, as a po you know, compared with this to a walk in the sun Air Force, mm -hmm. like movies that were made during the war, even the one we just talked about, uh, certainly made in the midst yep. of World War II. But this one is removed from it a little bit, so we'll yeah. see um, if that uh, if that does anything. Now, Jason, I have to point this out right now: the director Henry King, yeah. because we just made the joke about how this a movie we learned about, we both know it and we love it. Henry King did yeah. direct the song of Bernadette. <laughs> I just want to point that out right now. The movie that won best uh, best dr drama or comedy score, <laughs> the Oscars. Oh, okay. <laughs> against uh, <laughs> against Hangman also die. Yeah, it's just, so Neat. it's all coming together. Maybe maybe we're gonna have to watch that movie at some point. Just admit, just to some point. Just just as like a we'll come up with a segment of like we have to watch this movie because it came up too many times. Exactly. Yeah. Um. It's about a crazy uh adolescent peasant girl. So yeah, there you go. We'll have to watch it. Fine. Lee J. Cobb and Kinda Vincent like that, Price are in it. It's like that that girl from uh, 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 you know uh, the Doctor Zhivago. Yeah, sure. Yeah, With the fucking thing. She played the gang. You remember so much about that movie. 
<laughs> it was a long time ago, Brendan. No, it was a couple weeks. So, Jason, next week we will talk about 12 o'clock high. We are going back to the list. Um, of course, one of the letterbox comments that says one of the, re- one of the rejected titles of this movie was 1 o'clock munchies. Uh, but we'll talk about 12 <laughs> o'clock high next week. Henry King, Gregory Peck, our first uh, first Gregory Peck appearance on this uh, on this podcast. But until then, Jason, uh, they can find us all over the place. Uh, you can find us on any podcast app, or you can head to Age of Radio. Go to ageofradio.org slash for screen. And good day. You can also find us on Twitter, as I call it. You know what? I'm just going to make a pact right now. I'm never calling it X anymore. It's Twitter. It's fucking Twitter. It's Twitter. The end. So you can find us on Twitter at FSACpod, as in for screen. And good day. Podcast. And we're on Facebook, too. Jason, what about you? Where are you at? Yeah. I'm at Jason D. McLeod over on the terrible Twitter, but I am pleased to announce <gasps> that I finally <gasps> have received my Blue Sky invite. <gasps> so... You can find me at jasondmcleod.bsky.social. I'm over there. I've got a nice picture of my doggies in my header and a picture of uh, William Shatner with a mustache playing the corpse of Sam Kirk in an episode of Star Trek. So come on over and say hi. That is some specific porn. Yep. That's, that's my thing. All right. Well, there you go. So uh, join us, won't you? <laughs> well, we'll be back next week again talking about 12 o'clock high Gregory Peck. Um, but until then, Jason, I guess, um, you know, as we always do, I, I, we, we wrap things up, we uh, put in a neat little bow, and I say to you, good yep. sir, God save the king. And man, do I love Neo Swing. And for Screen and Country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. Does that mean that Keanu Reeves is on a little swing? Is that what that is? No, it means Keanu Reeves uh, 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 needs a bottle of beer and... What's that fucking song? I can't remember that song. <laughs> one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. No, no, it's a fucking, it's a ska song. It's, a, sure. it's like fucking, you know, those guys. The, the, I can't even do Best it. outro ever. Do you realize that Hitler only had one ball? A lot of people aren't aware of that. Hitler only had one ball. Well, actually, it was an undescended testicle, but what you see is what you got. Hitler only had one ball. People didn't know it at the time. People kept saying things like, Jesus, that Hitler, he must have a lot of balls, you know? (laughs) No, one. He started all that shit on one ball. The British Army knew about it. British Army had a song for him. Hitler has only got one ball. Goering has two, but they are small. (laughs) Himmler has something similar, but poor old Goebbels has no balls at all.